before we even begin i would just like to understand the composition of the audience relating to the talk how many of you have some experience in trading algorithmic trading or so you have a got it and the trading you're doing is manual or automated sir so for the trading i have done it for the terminal got it for nsc as well as i Got it. All right. So I'm assuming most of you don't have any finance or trading background. So here's what I. But you do have data science or programming background, right? So what I'll do is this talk by default. The way it's structured is it's very light on data science and very or a lot heavier on uh, markets and trading for somebody who has who knows programming but doesn't know uh, trading. right so that's what i'll introduce to you what i'll show here is a very rudimentary and watered down version of what actually happens but this should be enough to get the idea across and then you know if you're interested you can always explore more on your own time right so i'll just tell you guys briefly about myself my name is vihan singh i'm a final year student at ashoka university i'm studying mathematics and computer science and i'm the founder and chief executive officer very hefty title but is barely two people <laughs> so we are a firm that does systematic trading or algorithmic trading so there are many words i'll explain the difference uh, what we essentially do is we write computer algorithms and deploy machine learning and quantitative analysis techniques to somehow try and make money in the stock market everyone knows what the stock market is right yes is there anybody who doesn't know what the stock market is all right cool so that's what we are doing and so i'll just give you guys a brief overview of what these words are you might have heard the word quant quantitative trading algorithmic trading and they're all used very interchangeably so i'll sort of just run you over what these words actually mean and how they're distinct so on one end we have quantitative trading the other is algorithmic trading so quantitative trading has more of a base in mathematics whereas algorithmic trading is more of a computer science uh, uh, job this is where you're doing things like options pricing options is a type of contract where you're trying to price it ki iski sahi value kya honi chahiye what should be the correct market price for this uh, product or building indicators which is something we'll be doing in a few minutes which is designing you know signal processing filters or some kind of mathematical functions that will throw data into and get some output ki this will somehow tell me where the price is going to go in a few minutes or a few days from now algorithmic trading on the other hand is more about using speed and your computer architecture skills to outpace the other person you're faster than everybody else so for example execution algorithms or you might have heard of this high frequency trading right where you're trading on milliseconds or microseconds in time frame right so this is all a game of computer science here mathematics is not that big a deal your analysis is not as important as important is your speed and latency and are you co-located on the servers exchange or not so when you're doing quant trading you, you you'll be using python r matlab more research and uh, analysis languages whereas if you're doing uh, algorithmic trading you'll be sticking to c c++ java lower level languages which have lower latency compared to something like python today it is very rare for somebody to do just one of them or any institution to do just one of them they usually have a very solid research and modeling uh, infrastructure for quants and then their trades will be deployed using a very solid high frequency inter- infrastructure that's that'll be in c++ right so you sort of get the broad level differentiation between the two but i'll be using the words interchangeably because today whoever is doing one is probably doing the other also so now the quick overview of the presentation today is i'll first go over the why because i've realized in india people want to know why we are doing something before we actually start to do something like in school when we learned the formula i want to know why i'm learning this formula in trigonometry before i actually study it otherwise if i don't have the motivation i don't care which is reasonable huh? then we go into what we'll actually be learning and doing and then the how is sort of me showing you a bit of code on jupiter and you know what it would look like so right off the bat this is a question which you know given you guys don't have a trading background but i'm sure you've heard of warren buffett right yes, yes. very one of the richest people in the world said to be one of the most successful fund managers ever berkshire hathaway is his company today so he is said to be one of the most successful fund managers based on a simply net worth kind of thing right he's the third richest second richest man in the world but if we look at absolute returns which is if you put in say 1 lakh at the start of the year at the end of the year what percentage return did you get 
did you get a 100% return, which means you got 1 lakh out of your 1 lakh investment of 50%, which is 50,000. So, you have a question? Acha. So, who is the most successful fund manager on an absolute return basis? Because it's not Warren Buffett, and we'll see who it is in a moment. So, it's this guy, Mr. Jim Simmons, or James Simmons. He has a PhD in mathematics from Berkeley. He is the founder of a firm called Renaissance Technologies. This firm is what, say, Google is to search engines, Facebook is to social networks, Renaissance Technologies is to quantitative trading. And these guys are way more secretive than even the CIA or the NSA. These guys are super secretive, smartest people on the, some of the smartest people on the planet. They have barely 300 employees and a hundred of them have PhD in hard sciences. Right? So that's like a very high PhD to employee ratio. If you talk to three people at Renaissance, one of them probably has a PhD in a hard science from something like Caltech or MIT. So this guy started off as a trip analyst at NSA. Then he moved on to head the mathematics department at Stony Brook University. It's a university in Long Island, East Sotokit. And then he became the quant hedge fund manager of Renaissance Technologies, which he founded. And this is the firm's uh, campus, so to speak, because it's very much built like an academic uh, or like a college campus, because it's a lot of academics or ex-academics who are now working at Renaissance. And the description is they're a quantitative investment manager. So here, quantitative being they use maths and computer science. And they operate in the global financial markets, which means they trade everything from, you know, the U.S. stock market to commodities in Dubai to, you know, to, uh, futures, futures contracts in Japan to Indian rupees, everything. They'll trade anything that they can trade and make money on. And they do this strictly by using mathematical and statistical methods and a lot of computer science. They don't talk about it, but they do. And so they have this fund called the Medallion Fund. So a lot of fund managers want other people's money, right? If I have something that makes me money, I want you to give me money and I'll run it for you and take a profit share. The Medallion Fund, it's a mythical fund. They don't take anybody's money anymore. And they make nearly 74% every year. The fund is close to suppose, supposedly $10 billion. And it's only employees and partners of the firm, right? So think about it, $10 billion they have. They generate almost $7 billion every year and just distribute it within themselves. The guy, Jim Simmons, probably takes home like a billion dollars every year, right? So, and for comparison, Warren Buffett's annual return is only 22 to 23%. Jim Simmons started much later than Warren Buffett did. That's why there's a difference in the net worth. But these guys are crazy. And if you want a comparison, Berkshire Hathaway in blue is Warren Buffett's company's annual return compared to the Medallion Fund. And you can see... The Berkshire Hathaway actually lost money in 2-3 years. These guys have never lost money ever since 1989. And that's very hard to do when you're trading in the markets. Right? So, how exactly do they do, they do this? The, the very broad and generic overview is they combine mathematics, very uh, robust and rigorous mathematics, with very solid programming uh, and computer science. Like, they're optimized to the motherboard that is on the exchange that they'll be sending orders to they optimize the latency of their order firing mechanism to be as fast as possible right so it's, it's crazy nobody does this kind of stuff so now i'll give you guys a brief overview very quickly on you know things that you'll see if you're trading so this is what a candlestick looks like so you'll have to use some imagination here imagine some time interval like right? say we're thinking about a day so the stock price will start at some point in the day. That's what we call the open. Then it will go up, down and eventually stop when the day ends, when the trading ends in the day. The where it ends is called the close. The opening price is where it opened, the closing price is where it ended the day. The high is the highest price during that period. So this is the highest price it reached in the day. And the low is the lowest price it reached in the day. So if it opened lower than it closed, that means the price over the course of the day eventually ended higher. So it will be colored in green. And if it opened, then went high and low and eventually closed below the open, it will be colored in red. So on the net, the price went down. This makes sense to everyone? So this is what you call a candlestick. Now when you combine many of these candlesticks, so think of this as one day. Now if you have a lot of such days, so these would be your different candlesticks. The colors are off because I've inverted the colors. So here the pink ones uh, demarcate the price going up and the blue ones is probably price going down, right? So these are all the candlesticks. Make sense? Price opened here, went up, went down, closed somewhere. So this is the information it shows you on a time series 
uh, kind of uh, format, right? So these are different days and what the price did on that day. Make sense? Now, you'll see a lot of different lines on there. There's different ways people analyze the markets and the stocks. Technical analysis is one of them. Warren Buffett is a strictly fundamental investor. He cares about what the company is doing. If the company finances are good, is the management sound? Technical analysts don't care about what the company is. They just look at the price chart and the volume of the trading and they say all the price, the price has all the information that you would need about any company. The price will do what all the market participants wanted to do and they already know what is going to happen. Is the technical analysis way of thinking things. Whether it works or not, we'll find out. Right, so they draw different kinds of things. They could draw lines, averages, so on and so forth. And they'll all do something or the other to try and tell you what the price will do. So for example, you'll see an average of the price, for example, this one, all it's doing is taking an average of the price say, in the past 10 days. So here, this point is the average of the price in the past 10 days. That makes sense? So this is what you call a moving average. It takes the average over a moving window, right? Simple. It's all basic technical analysis jargon. So what we'll do now in this workshop very quickly is recreate a technical indicator. I'll tell you guys what the uh, idea is behind that technical indicator which was originally built by this guy John Bollinger and the indicators are called Bollinger Bands. Now what they do and how they work we'll go into that. So here we have a normal distribution. Is there anybody who does not know what a normal distribution is? Awesome. So here we are making an assumption and of course as you guys being data scientists and programmers would probably know that anything you do especially in mathematics and you know research has some kind of assumptions involved, right? So here we will make the assumption that prices of stocks are normally distributed, right? That their behavior over time, the change is normally distributed. So they should fall within this range. Most of them don't move too much. Sometimes it will go around a bit, but very rarely should it cross certain points. Now, what are these? These are the standard deviation or sigmas as we know them, right? And we know that within two standard deviations, roughly 92% of the price behavior should be contained, right? This makes sense to everyone? That 92% of the time, the price will be between two standard deviations of its movement. So what we'll do is, we'll take this idea and we'll think about this a bit. So this is where the art is involved. This is not, we're not doing data science, so to speak. We're doing the art of data. So we say, we, uh, today the price is at some level. Over the past, say, 10 days, the standard, two times the standard deviation added to the mean is here. Two times the standard deviation subtracted from the mean is here. The price is currently here. Now, if the price closes somewhere with, within these bands, it's completely normal, right? 92% of the time, this should happen. But on the day when it closes below that band or above that band, now we have some kind of statistical anomaly, so to speak, right? We could have taken three standard deviations. Let's just stick with two for now. So when this happens, then we think, oh, Maybe something interesting is happening. Now, either price tried to go up, but 92% of the time we know it, it should stay within. So probably it's going to now come down within the band, right? It touched the band on the top and now it will come down. Or if it touched, touched the band on the bottom, it will start going up. So this is what Bollinger Bands look like, right? This is just the standard deviation, two times standard deviation added and subtracted from the mean over the past some X days. We don't know how many days this is, but it doesn't matter. So for example, if it's five days, I look back at the prices of the past five days, take their mean, take the standard deviation, multiply it by two, add it and subtract it. Now, if the price touches the top, it's touching the upper Bollinger band, it is exceeding that two sigma move. Now I expect this will probably come down within the band and as it does. Now, when it touches the bottom, it goes up. When it touches the top, it comes back down. When it touches the bottom, it goes back up. Make sense? If, if, if anything is not clear, please do let me know. Because if, if not, then this really doesn't make any sense. Right? This makes sense to everyone? Awesome. So this is the basic idea that now we have essentially created some kind of idea that we'll create these bands. And when the stock hits the top, we'll short it. Do, I, you guys probably don't know what shorting is. You guys all know that you can buy a stock and then sell it. Right? You can, and you make money doing that if the price goes up. But what if you know the price is about to go down? How do you make money doing that? That's when you do something called a short sell. You borrow the stock from somebody else, sell it in the market right now, and when the price goes down, you buy it back and give it to the person you borrowed from. 
the person you borrowed from had stock in the beginning and at the end so he doesn't care you borrowed it and sold it at say 10 rupees price fell down to 5 rupees and you bought it back and you gave it back to the person you sold something at 10 bought it back at 5 so you 5 rupee was your profit make sense so you've inverted the process of buying and selling usually people buy and then sell you borrowed and sold bought and gave it back so you sold first and bought later this makes sense so what we'll do is short over here buy over there short over there buy over there right so now this thing i'll just show you guys how i've coded this up a bit so the nifty 50 index is the track of the indian economy so to speak it is the comp composition of 50 of the biggest companies or stocks listed in india it's the average a weighted average so i take some data for the nifty 50 for the past um, five years almost five years since 2015 i resample it so i have data that gives me one minute bars so those candlesticks we were seeing i have those on a one minute frequency what i'll do is i'll resample them and i'll turn it into 10 minutes right so first we'll take an in sample set as we do as data scientists yes so why will, why will someone just rent uh, their share or their to us, uh, so, get any out so this is again a technical matlab, finance matter and you know you can look it up you can find million answers on Quora you why know, do people there was a movie also on this big shot uh, so about yeah this this, this you it's I know it's a stupid concept why would I want to lend something of mine to when I'm not getting anything but there are ways why this happens and how this happens and people usually do get something for that lending right so I, but I won't get into that because that's a different matter so in sample, we have decided we'll take data from 2015, 16, and 17, create a strategy on it, and see if it works. And then we'll test it on 18 and whatever data we have for 19. Makes sense? So the in sample, out of sample. It's an arbitrary split. I haven't done the 80, 20, or 70, 30. I've just divided it into three years and one and a half years. So. Yes. So we take the price data from 2015 to 18. Oh, like. 2015, 16, and 17, ending at 18, we resample it, as in we turn 1 minute bars into 10 minute bars. It's essentially, you know, going to a higher uh, resolution as opposed to going deeper into granularity. Then we pre then I've just imported the PyT is a package you can get in Python for technical indicators. It stands for Python technical indicators. I've imported the upper Bollinger Band, lower Bollinger Band, and middle Bollinger Band calculations for it. Upper is the upper two standard deviation, lower is lower, middle is just the mean. All right. Then I calculate the Bollinger Bands. So I took the periods of 21 and 2. So the past 21 days, I take the price, take the mean, take the two standard deviation above and below, uh, added and subtracted to the mean, and then I plot it. So this is what it looks like. So this is all within a day, over the period of 10 10 minutes, right? So we see that it sort of touched the bottom, went back up, touched the top, went back down, closed below there, sort of went back up, things like that happen. So now I have, yes? On the x-axis, they are the stock prices. No, on the x-axis is time, on the y is the price. This is the first 10 minutes, then this is the next 10 minutes. So the stock market say opens at 9.15, right? This is 9.15, this is 9.25, this is uh, 9.35, so on and so forth. We have something called as PE ratio also. Yes. So that is the effect. PE ratio is not a technical thing. PE ratio is a fundamental thing. This is what Warren Buffett would look at. This is a company financial. So that is uh, 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 after effect of this on me. Does it uh, depends on this? Or yes. So when price fluctuates, PE ratio will automatically fluctuate. But PE ratio is used as a long term uh, thing. Here we are looking at 10 minutes, right? 10 minutes may nobody cares if the earnings went up or down. The company operates, so Warren Buffett buys and holds companies for many years. Renaissance Technologies and like ourselves and most traders buy and sell in a few minutes, few seconds, few microseconds or maybe a few days, right? So the PE ratio is something you care about when you're holding something for many years. Make sense? All right. So this is sort of, I've just plotted it using the uh, a library built on top of Matplotlib called MPL Finance. So it quickly plots the charts and then I, I just plotted the Bollinger Bands. So when it touches the green one here, I go short. And when, when it closes below the red one here, I go long. So I've coded up that logic right here, long open and long close. Long means when I'm buying and short means I'm short sell. Right? So the opening logic 
and the closing logic. The closing logic is once it, if I short it here, I'll close it once it comes below the middle band. And if I bought it here, I'll close it once it closes above the middle band, right? And I'm sorry guys, I'm going very quickly because we are running out of time, but you know, yes. Can you compute the duration it will take to go to the middle line? No, we don't know how long it will take. We, the price will do whatever it does. We just know that when the price goes below the band, we'll buy it. And when it goes above the middle band, we'll close that position. Right? So we, yes. Yes, sure. So the time is 10 minutes. Yes, 10 minute frames. Yeah, and the volume demands that you said are basically two sigma, two points of the standard deviation, right? Yes. So I was wondering how is it changing drastically within like that 10 minutes? So what the reason this change you're seeing yeah. is because this is the start of a day and the previous day the price might have closed somewhere else. This is called gapping. So the price might have closed yesterday at say 10 rupees and opens the next day at 5 rupees. This does happen in the market. Because there's trading happening within those times when the market is closed. Right? So, that's why the bands might change very quickly towards the start of the day. Then you'll see they're more stable. Right? So, that those things do happen at the start of the day. This is a very interesting time of day. So, people either trade a lot during that or some people don't trade at all. Because anything can happen. Right? So, that's why you're seeing those big deviations. So, what's the logic here? If it touches the upper band, then at that time you will short it. Yeah, we'll, we'll short it, yes. And then it touches the lower, lower band, we'll buy it. How you will control the stop loss? So, stop loss, I'm not even getting into right now. The way I have done it here, if you want to know, <laughs> is that I've taken the previous bars high as my stop loss when I'm shorting and the previous bar low as the stop loss when I'm buying. Right? So, don't care about what, what a stop loss is for now. <laughs> So then we tested this, so then we back tested it, essentially simulated if I had done this buying and selling based on this logic in 2015, 16 and 17, what would it have done? And so this is all the back testing code and I generate a report and then we see that it starts at 2015, first uh, of uh, 10th of January ends on the 8th of December in 2017. Then we see the numbers which, you know, might not make sense to you, but this is what, what is important. This is what the Nifty did, and this is if you were traded traded the strategy. This is what your portfolio would have done, right? So in 2015, you made 16 percent, then you made 16 percent again, then you made 11 percent, which is actually pretty good, right? So there's something called alpha, which is the return you're generating above the market. How much better are you than the market? So we can look at annualized returns as 14 percent, and annualized alpha is also 14 percent. So essentially, what this is saying is over the course of these uh, three years, the market essentially gave you nothing in terms of returns, whereas the strategy did. Right? Make sense? So now we test it out of sample. So we take 2018 onwards data, do the resampling, plot those bars, look the same, then the price will change. And then we do the same kind of test, and then we see, does it still work? Because in sample is what I'd probably build the strategy on. If this didn't work, I'll change the parameters, tweak them, do something and make it work in the in-sample, like manually, or you could automate the process as very good data science and ML engineers, and then test it out of sample. Does it work out of sample? And it does. So over the course of 2018, which was a very bad year for most people, because the price was going crazy up and down, we actually made 27% doing just this, and we have already would have made 13% doing this if we had traded this this year, which is again very good. The annualized alpha on this is even higher. This is 20% uh, annualized alpha. Because the market has essentially effectively tanked and gone back to zero. As you can see, it's started here and it's still very close to zero after one and a half years. And so that's how you can sort of use data and data science and programming to you know build strategies. And then if you have a broker like Zerodha, Upstocks, you can plug it into the API. The price will come in, it will process the logic, it will do the trades, and you can you know chill and make money. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it is possible. Alright, and that is the end of my talk.